news first. One of the individuals that will be joining us in our Q&A portion this afternoon. So to start off, he has a total of seven years experience in different companies like Personal Collection and Yondu Incorporated, and he is continuously developing web applications, collaborating with different teams for continuous development and managing the web development team for crafting systems for all kinds of management and business related applications in need of automation. He is currently the lead software engineer for Rethink IT Inc. and is part of the pioneering team that has developed and created the very first and the only safety and risk management solution in the Philippines, Rethink EHS. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Daryl Bernardo. Sir Daryl. Um, there you go, Sir Daryl. And moving on, it is my pleasure now to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the lecture we have this afternoon. She is a chemical engineer and a safety consultant helping organizations achieve safety excellence by protecting people, the environment, and business. She is also an environment health and safety leader with nearly 20 years of experience from diverse industries. She has handled international HSE leadership roles and worked with diverse teams locally and internationally. Her expertise includes safety leadership, holistic safety, process safety management, occupational safety and health management, emergency crisis management, Six Sigma Black Belt, environmental management and management systems or standards, to name a few. She also authored ebooks entitled The Makings of a Leader, The Foundation of Safety or Why Safety. To share her knowledge and passion about leadership and safety in the academe, she teaches occupational safety and health for engineers, process safety, chemical process industries, chemical reaction engineering, reactor design, engineering management, and environmental science and engineering. She also has a postgraduate degree in biblical studies. Aside from being involved with local safety organizations and Philippine Institute of Chemical Engineers, she is also a member of UK's Institution for Chemical Engineers and American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Currently, she is the general manager of Rethink IT Inc., the developer of Rethink EHS safety management software and other IT solutions. So without further ado, here is engineer John S. Janela, our keynote speaker for today's event, Ms. Joanne. Thank you, Alex. Can you hear me well? Yes, certainly we can hear you well. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. I think we are going international. And I yes, hope right. you will bear with me if I shift to my native tongue, but we'll do our best to translate it to our international language as best as we can. All right, so this is our annual webinar, free webinar through our Safety How, which is our professional collaboration platform. And this has been the advocacy of our company, Rethink IT, to pay it forward to the safety community, considering that we have the expertise in safety and information technology. Safety How is a product of our hearts and not just purely because it's part of our core strengths or expertise, but it's because it's part of our corporate social responsibility. And that's why Safety How is a free collaboration platform. And we have established this to be a practice that annually, at least annually, we would be able to host a free webinar to our safety community. So this presentation or this webinar is very close to our heart. Uh, basically, it's because it's about technology and safety. It's the intertwine or the integration of not only the safety management, but also the technology as well as the human uh, workforce. In my background, in nearly 20 years in safety, I have been exposed. I have worked with global companies as well, and I've been exposed 
to several safety management uh, software. But oftentimes we encounter safety professionals who are very willing and open to start shifting, especially that we are now in industry 4.0, to shift in digital transformation, but have the difficulty or the challenge of presenting it or building a business case to the top management. Because oftentimes we present safety from ethics perspective. And there's nothing wrong with that because the bottom line of safety is about moral value or the moral value of a human life. And that's where we are all coming from as safety professionals. However, most often than not, safety professionals or safety officers here in the Philippines have difficulty translating that moral value of safety into a business value or technological value. And therefore, it deemed that it's our moral obligation to impart or share that knowledge to the safety community and be able to help you transform your organization through a digital transformation. So let me share my uh, screen. So please bear with me as I cannot see your chat in the meantime while we are doing the presentation. We'll do the Q&A after the, after the presentation proper. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Amen. So thumbs up or yes, uh, Alex or Bianca would be able to see your interaction, guys. But please bear with me as I go through the presentation. So our title for this webinar is to rethink safety and technology's disruptive potential. So we are now in industry 4.0 going to industry 5.0 and industry 4.0 starts with the digital transformation. But basically we are starting to have technology as part of our life and not just part of our work, but eventually part of our lives. So just so COVID, for example, has now become part of an occupational risk or a life risk. No, it's been part of what's going on now, the day-to-day -day activity in this world. The same as when it comes to uh, technology, it's inevitable. It's going to happen sooner, not later. And the question is, how are we going to evolve as human beings, basically? How are, we going, how are we going to adjust in the pace of technology when technology is, mu is much faster to evolve and change compared to the capacity of the human workforce or the human beings to adapt to changes? And how are we going to make the most of its disruptive potential? So it's dual meaning basically when we say disruptive. It may be, it may connote a negative uh, impression that when we say disruptive, it might be uh, obstructive, but not necessarily that when we say disruptive, it means that we are game changers. No, it, it changes the way we do things on a positive perspective, positive note or a positive perspective. So how are we going to make the most of the technology in order to make our safety more efficient, more effective, more adaptable to changes, even to the crisis, for example, to the crisis of COVID-19 or throughout, throughout the life cycle or the life of our plant of our, or our um, company. So I would like to uh, challenge you to listen, digest, and we hope that through this webinar, we would be able to help you understand at high level, even at least on high level, what is the value of technology in safety why do we need to evolve? It's just a matter of time. It is inevitable. How do we integrate safety, technology, and the human workforce? And how would we be able to be the initiator of that change or innovation or that positive continuous, continuous improvement in our company as safety professionals? All right. So here is our outline for this afternoon. So we're basically going to go through what are the pain points of safety professionals currently in this digital age. And the next one would be, what would be the solution to the problem? 
what are the solutions that we have now and what more solutions we'll be able to have with the digital now that we are in a digital age. What are the concerns or some uh, fears probably when it comes to safety te technology and digitization? If we know as safety professionals, we are doomsday preppers. And then that's part of our nature. That's part of our emotional, mental, or physical training as safety professional to prepare for the worst case uh, scenario. And therefore, technology is no exemption to the rule for us when it comes to risk management. Yes, it is a solution, but what are the potential risks and danger so that we as safety professionals would be able to really provide a solution to the problem and not just add problem to the problem, not add risk to the problem. And what is the value of the safety workforce in technology and digitization? What's going to happen to us, human workforce, are we going to be obsolete? And, or how are we going to interact with the change? How are we going to adapt to the change? How fast can we adapt to that uh, change? And what are the disruptive potential of technology in advancing your safety or our safety in the company and the business? Is it just a qualitative? Is it just abstract? Is it just a wish or it has substantial quantitative benefits in our business? But how are we going to present it to our top management or how do we present it to our community in such a way that we will be able to help each other advance in technology, but able, but would be able to be resilient with all these changes? So that's part of our safety how uh, community. Now I will deep dive to the contents of our webinar. So the first thing would be the pain points of safety professionals. So I am I think you're quite aware, I have introduced myself that I have nearly 20 years of experience already in safety and probably I cannot, of course, claim that I have experienced everything, but at least I have experienced substantial amount of what a safety professionals, I would say, suffer or struggle with in a day-to-day -day, uh, operation. So I've worked with sugar manufacturing, petroleum, chemical manufacturing, ophthalmic, uh, ophthalmic lenses, or polymerization process, telco and BPO, and now with uh, IT. So who would have thought that a chemical engineer would be in the IT industry now? But more than that, what are the common uh, pain points of safety professionals, especially here in the Philippines, or basically it's common even, even around the world. We know that in safety, we have a lot of administrative tasks. Yes, we have a lot of, we have a lot of reports to collect. We have a lot of programs, good programs for the company. We have a lot of data to collect, but what are we, go what are we doing with those data? Of course, we have to analyze those data because what's the point of collating the data if it's not going to be analyzed and used for business decisions or safety strategic decision? If it's not going to be an objective basis or reference for us to identify the gaps in our safety management system and use it as our benchmark or baseline to improve our safety management system, then there's no point in collecting the data. So it's going to be a waste of efforts, waste of energy, waste of resources. So when we say resources, we're not just referring to money, we're, we're not just referring to time, but as well as money. So it's all money lost for the company. So at least here in the Philippines, what you see there as a list of probably reports of activities are, are not comprehensive or is not basically comprehensive. So number one, Hazards. What do we do with hazards? We go around our plant, we go around our production area, we observe, we look for hazards. So basically, we look for problems that we need to solve in terms of safety or in the context of safety. We don't wait for hazards to become an incident because what's the point of being in safety if we wait for incidents to happen? And that's why it's very important to be advanced thinker or forward thinker or a future forward thinking in safety. 
So it's very important to be proactive in safety because otherwise we will be caught by surprise by incidents. All of a sudden, we will just experience an explosion in the plant. For example, from my previous company, we have a polymerization process, which is a highly hazardous chemical process, exothermic. So meaning to say, if we fail in our process parameters, there's a possibility that a pressure vessel will explode. So, or the worst case is the laboratory or the production area will have an explosion or our mini laboratory will have, have an explosion, explosion and therefore will have fire in our plant. So that's the significance of hazards. Why do we need to look for hazards before hazards catch us by surprise and it becomes an incident? So hazards, we just don't jot them down. We collate them into our, into our HIROC registry. So in HIROC registry, we know that in, in safety professionals, that we start with our baseline hazard identification, hazards mapping, right from the start of our plant up to its operation, even up to its uh, end of life. We do HIROC or hazards identification, risk assessment and control. And when we say registry, it's not just for documentation purposes only. We know that it is a records of all hazards and what is the level of risk for all those hazards? What are the controls? How, how regardless of how many controls we have implemented. And then we have to reanalyze again the level of risk so that we can identify or determine the residual risk or if the controls are effective. So that's just HIRAC registry. The incidents, so aside from the hazards and the HIRAC, we have incidents, of course. Since we are not omniscient or all-knowing, so there will be tendencies that there will be incidents that will happen in the plant one way or another. But we hope that that incident or those incidents will not be lost time incidents, but probably it will just be near misses or near hit incidents. So it's not uh, catastrophic for the company. The next one would be the BBS or behavior-based safety reports and data. So when we do BBS, we observe not just the physical hazards or anything that we can feel and uh, see external to our human workforce. But in BBS, we know that we observe behaviors of human beings or our workforce. And that's part of the skill of safety professionals. We know how to read behaviors. And that's quite, it's both, a it's both, a leverage, uh, it is an advantage and a disadvantage for safety professionals because we, we are trained to read behaviors. Okay? That's part of uh, psychology in safety. In my background, I have not only handled safety, but I, I have also handled industrial security. So if some of you, and it's common here in the Philippines that safety and industrial security belong to one department only or by or headed by by the department manager which is collectively called safety but it is a combination of environment health safety and of course uh, security so in security is the more psychological training on how to read behaviors so that's part it's not only physical security but we deal with psychological security and that and that is a adv advantage and disadvantage. Why? Because it might take a toll on us that even outside of work already, we are going to use that skill unnecessarily, or at least even at work, um, we have to be able to manage those psychological uh, skills. So how do we do that? In BBS, we observe unsafe or at-risk behaviors, behaviors of employees that may have the tendency to cause harm, damage to property, to their fellow workers, to the community, or to their stakeholders primarily. And we need to modify them. So we know that when it comes to behaviors, it's a product of upbringing, of culture, education, and of course, the corporate culture or the safety culture in the company. And that's the most difficult thing to deal with, is the human complexity. It, compared to technology, equipment, or 
chemicals, the most complex to deal with would be the human complexity because it's a product. It's a culmination of not just only the DNA, but everything that has influenced that person into who they are now as an adult. And therefore in VBS, it, it will take a lot of coaching. So all of those reports, imagine that you just don't observe, which is your physical task as a safety professional. You go to the production line and you physically observe the behaviors of the workers. And then you collect the data. You record it in your BBS card or your uh, observation card if, if you do it manually. We used to do it manually from a previous company. And after that, once you have collected all those reports or behavior observation cards, you start to encode them manually, of course, to your laptop or to your computer. And then from there, you define or you determine how are you going to analyze the data. So trans translate that data into a graphical representation. And that's what we call KPI. So we have the graphs now. So that will be, it will be easier for safety professionals, for safety committee, as well as for the top management to interpret the data from your PPS reports. The other one, of course, is our occupational safety and health or safety related regulate, uh, regulatory permits and licenses. So we have a bunch of that just to, well, that's an understatement basically when we say a bunch of that. So it's not just a bunch, you know? it's a lot of safety related regulatory permits and licenses that we need to monitor, track, and ensure that we are not caught off guard, that we will have lapses in terms of permits and licenses. Why? Because the business depends on it. We might be given a notice of violation. It might not be just a notice of violation, but who knows the worst case scenario will be a cease and desist order. And that is not only an economic impact, but also a, re a reputational impact to the business. So imagine one safety officer doing the hazards observation, high rec registry, incident investigation, near misses, behavior observations, monitoring of our, regular, of our regulatory permits and licenses. Now we go to incident investigation reports. We do root cause analysis. And for those of us who have been through the root cause analysis, we know that it is a tedious task. It's very time consuming mentally draining task. If we are serious when it comes to incident investigation, we really we really deep dive into the root causes of the incident. No matter how small we think it is, we know that it's just the tip of the iceberg and a proactive safety professional or safety officer will, will get down into the bottom of it. What's the, what's the real issue? What's the root cause of the problem? And therefore it's, takes a lot of analysis and administrative tasks. So typing, uh, probably it's more on secretarial that you, so basically you're not just a technical expert when you are a safety professional. You also do the administrative task as a, as a subject matter expert. Safety committee minutes of the meetings, we're quite familiar with, with that. Here in the Philippines, we have our monthly uh, safety committee meetings, and therefore it is, it is expected that we have monthly safety committee minutes of the meetings. It's either we submit it monthly to our regulatory body here, Occupational Safety and Health Center or Bureau of Working Conditions, or online now. And we also have our quarterly OSH performance reports that we submit. So either way, whether we present it to our internal stakeholders, meaning to say our top management, our management team, we have, we have our monthly business reviews or stakeholders meeting, or let's say board meetings, we present it up to the board. What's the performance of safety in our company? We also report it to the regulatory bodies. The next one would be our work accident or incident uh, report. We now have the COVID report. Uh, report form as well, but as generic, we have our work accident and incident report, or we call it WIR. Next one is the annual exposure data report or AEDR, the annual medical report. The annual medical report is a 
combination or the statistics of all the health related uh, cases or inventories or records in our company. So it's not just the APE results, but everything. So this is just straightforward, the terminologies of the reports or administ administrative tasks that we do in safety. But we are not deep diving yet, or we are not yet delving into the uh, background or the other groundwork that we need to do to form or to produce this kind of report. Next one will be the report of safety organization. Employee safety training. So we know that right from the onboarding of employees, there should be safety induction. And not just the employees, but could be including contractors themselves. And depends on your timing and when it comes to the refresher courses, safety induction can be repeated every two years or it will evolve or anytime that there are changes in the hazards or risk profile of the company, we can scale that to employees. So those are just one of the trainings, safety induction. But how about Bosch, basic occupational safety and health trainings, chemical safety trainings, and all the safety trainings you can think of. The safety officer collates them all, monitors them all, tracks them all, measures them all. So for me to work, when we have non-routine activities in our company, it's either routine work will be under our maintenance team and non-routine work would be done by our contractors. We have for me to work a system. And again, that's a lot of documentations just to make sure that everything is under control. Safety policies and our standard operating procedures. So aside from this day-to-day -day administrative tasks and reports or documentations that we need to do, we also have to develop or produce our standard operating procedures or safe operating procedures. And all of that should be, do should be done or being done by safety officers as well. The next one would be safety equipment maintenance or your PPE monitoring right from your acquisition or procurement up to the entire life cycle of your PPE. You would have to manage that. Why? Because we have to measure the effectiveness of our PPE because PPE is one of our controls or part of our hierarchy of controls. So what's the use of just providing PPE for free to our employees and we don't measure the effectiveness of it? We don't know that we might be losing money and we thought we are providing controls or we are providing solution to the problem when in fact we are burning money. So if we're able to monitor our PPE program effectively, it's not just going to help provide PPE control in a certain hazard or risk, but at the same time, it could be a potential cost savings for the company. So therefore, you will have a cost-effective PPE management program. Contractors information, we usually have contractors accreditation program or contractor safety management program. And that is as good as other requirements or the same as require our, our requirements for our employees from safety induction to their licenses, to their permits. But on top, on top of that, we also require them permit to work. So it's like handling two companies or multiple, not just two companies, but multiple companies and employees records. So what if you have 50 contractors or 50 subcontractors or more than or about 100 uh, business units, for example? How would you manage all those reports and documentations? Of course, we have our audit reports. That's part of our lives as safety professionals. The audit reports could be internal and external. It could be, de depends on the frequency that you have defined in terms of your certification audits, for example, or management system audits, if we have external accreditation. Or when it comes to our internal audits, depend on our internal audit team or quality management uh, team. So audit reports, it might be uh, easy to hear audit reports, that's the finished product actually 
of the audits, but all throughout the audit process, there's a lot of documentation that we need to prepare ahead of time. Of course, our observations and inspection reports, whether it is our safety equipment inspection reports, fire pumps, fire extinguishers, our work environment measuring, measurement devices, so on and so forth. So we inspect them all because that's part of safety that we need to ensure that all our controls are good and effective. Aside from that, depends on our activity. So non-routine activities, inter internal non-routine activities would have a job hazard analysis or that's part of our permit work. We also have our job hazard analysis on top of our high rack registry. So that's already part of our operations. Incident frequency and severity rate. So when we have to report our key performance indicators already, we measure for now as part of a regulatory requirement, the lagging indicators, frequency and severity rate. However, if you want to be proactive safety professionals, we know that we should not settle for lagging indicators. We want leading indicators. We need to say proactive indicators or those indicators that will help us predict a hazard, the behavior of a hazard or the behavior of the risk or forecast, stimulate a potential incident in the worst case scenarios. So that will help us have more information so that we will become proactive. And of course, our objective in safety is to, pre is to prevent the worst case scenarios from happening. And of course, the last but not the least, our happy moments in the company are safe man hours and milestones. So we monitor them. How much of our man hours we have gathered all throughout the life cycle of our company. How many million man hours are safe man hours without lost time incidents? Those are milestones. And that's why we account the man hours or the working hours of our companies because we celebrate them. So those are the qualitative rewards of, the safe, of safety or having safety in the company. But how do we translate the man hours into its monetary or business value? So most often than not, our safety professionals have difficulty translating the qualitative value of safety to its business or monetary value. So according to Harvard Business Review research or study, so this is merely for safety managers only, so it's not exhaustive uh, study or data. So 54% of the time is used for administrative tasks or administrative work. So based on our experience in Rethink IT, when we ask for feedback from our stakeholders, they would say that it's either 50% or 60% of their time is used for reports, data collection, data encoding, data analysis, reporting, administrative tasks. And those are not strategic actions for safety officers. Why? Because the role of safety officers is to drive continuous improvement in safety for the company, to really find faults in terms of management system in order to prevent them or control them before they get worse. That's supposed to be the role of safety officers or safety professionals in the company and not be buried into all those reports or paperwork. So imagine that. So it's actually a conservative estimate when they said that about four hours or five hours of their time, 50% or 60% of their time, they are just using it in administrative tasks. For as long as those administrative tasks or those reports are not yet translated to substantial data that can be used for strategic decisions and actions. The processing, the collection, the collecting process, the processing of those data is, is actually considered a non-value adding task. And we know that from those of you who have continuous improvement program in your company, or if you have a Six Sigma program in your company, you have CI, or process in, or you apply process engineering, so we're driven by continuous improvement. 
So we know that administrative tasks are considered non-value adding tasks. It does not translate to business value. It does not translate to uh, money or revenue generation. So that's why most often than not, again, safety is, per is perceived as an expense. Although we promote as safety professionals or safety officers, we communicate to our top management or leadership team or to our people that safety is not an expense, it is an investment. And yet we have difficulty supporting that argument or that thesis that safety is not an expense. It is supposed to be an investment because we're not able to provide the business value of safety. So which is fair enough for safety professionals. Again, like what I said earlier, we are coming from the ethics perspective or the bottom line of safety is about ethics, which is good. But of course, in reality, for our business, we do not have infinite resources. And our ethics is part of the way we do things or operate. That's very important when it comes to leadership. But at the same time, we understand that the company has to be sustainable economically or business-wise for it to grow. And therefore, it's very important that safety is part of operational strategy. So aside from it has ethical value or qualitative value, we need to communicate what is the quantitative or economic or business value of safety for the growth of the company. So imagine if 54% of your time are redeemed or is redeemed from doing all these administrative tasks in safety, you're able to redeem it and use that 54% of time to actual actions, thinking innovations, thinking safety technology, thinking of the advancement and improvements that you can do to help your business grow and become globally competitive by ensuring that your employees and your company are safe. So I will let it sink. So imagine that. And what are you, what would you feel about it? So if all those administrative tasks will be streamlined. And that's the drive. We're not just getting into the technology yet. Even in continuous improvement, that's already the drive of Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma or continuous improvement. It is streamlining the process, identifying the shortest process, the shortest and cost-effective, most effective process fastest, but accurate. So speed and accuracy is what we need. So aside from all those administrative tasks, those administrative tasks that we are supposed to be converting into real actions in identifying potential hazards and risks so we prevent incidents from happening, we know that hazards and incidents cost. Cost a lot in the company. So based on HSE uh, study, Health Safety Executive of UK, the indirect cost is 2.7 times the direct cost. So when we say the direct cost, the immediate cost or expense in order for us to mitigate an incident or damage control. On top of that, those other costs, underlying costs, is 2.7 times that direct cost. Imagine if you have spent about $1 million or pesos, for example. So other indirect costs will be about 2.7. Therefore, your total cost will be around $4 million for pesos. So how much would it uh, cost the company? It's 4.7 or 3.7 or 4 million pesos or dollars. Is it cheap for the company? Of course not. So everything has a cost in the company because all resources have cost. So every time that we have hazards uncontrolled and incidents, that incident is considered a loss or a damage. So we just don't account it religiously, but it's very important actually in safety that we account the costs of hazards and incidents. And therefore, the business or a business team or a leadership team 
would appreciate from a business perspective the value of doing safety or the value of safety in the company. We just don't say that we need to do safety because it is the right thing to do. Yes, it is an ethical thing to do because we are responsible, we are ethical uh, business leaders in our industry, but at the same time, safety is the right thing to do for the business because it saves costs. So it saves costs or saves money for the company. So aside from the cost of hazards and incidents, in order to manage them or do damage control, we also need to set up a safety department, for example. So all companies, all organizations, for example, at least here in the Philippines, regardless of the size of our company, we are required to have a safety officer. So it's either a safety officer one, safety officer two, or again, it depends on the size of the company and the nature of our industry. So the requirements for the safety officer alone would cost already for the or will be a cost already for the management. So how much if we have to do trainings? So aside from the personnel itself, organizational management and supervision, we need to hire safety officers. We need to hire safety managers, safe subject matter experts. We also need to do training. We need to train them. We need to provide the right equipment or personal protective equipment, the safety equipment, and we have the crisis or emergency funds as part of our crisis management. The administrative tasks that we need to do, not only dealing with the incidents, but the routine administrative mundane tasks of collating and analyzing those data. And if we need OSH professional services, that for example, we need the higher qualifications or expertise in safety that we cannot find inside our company, then we need to get a consultant and that's OSH professional services, or it could be a safety training organization or other service provider. For example, those who, who maintain our safety equipment. So those are considered OSH professional services and other health and safety capital investments. So we need to invest in new equipment or a new asset that will be part of health and safety. So what's the return on investment there for? So this is not just to mention the cost of it. So basically, how much budget do we need just to have safety department in our company? That's another cost. So aside from that, multiply it with the number of your employees or the size of your company. How many fire extinguishers do you need? How many fire bombs? How many fire trucks? How many safety equipment do you need, basically, or PPE? How many personnel do you need to train? How many PPE do you need to provide to them? So on and so forth. So imagine all the cost that, that it will entail. So safety has a cost. Safety itself has a cost of doing it, maintaining it, setting it up. And on top of that, there are costs when we have accidents or incidents. Now, what's the solution to the problem? What's our proposed solution to that tedious administrative task that we consider non-value adding actions, uh, which is therefore a waste? How can we redeem that? And how can we translate it into a business value or a value adding actions for our business? Of course, it is inevitably, the solution would be technology. We are now in the digital age. Gone are the days that we tend to think that it's not going to happen. The Y2K is not going to happen. And there comes Y2K. And we, we're going to, we might be uh, thinking of, um, how do you say that? Uh, doomsday, is, there's going to be an uprising of uh, androids or robots or whatever and whatnot. But the thing is, it's there. It's already there and it's already here. It's, it's not a matter of just time that we're going to wait for it to happen. It's already happening and it is inevitable. So we are already in this uh, age, whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, that's already what's happening globally. 
So our solution to the problem is, of course, to streamline our process. So I'm coming from my background in Six Sigma Black Belt, as well as from my background in safety, which is to simplify the processes. Simplify, but the most cost-effective process. Who does not want to simplify things? Who wants to deal with uh, layers of layers of reports? Who wants to waste their time on administrative tasks, right? So you want your job, we want our job to be fast, but we don't want our job just to be fast, but we want it accurate. So we're not just after, the efficiency is not just the measurement of the speed. So when we measure the efficiency, it refers to the speed and accuracy. And we know that our accuracy and precision, the rep repeatability or the consistency of the accepted or expected results. So that's the level of, uh, that's precision and accuracy. So we want to have a precise and accurate process. And in terms of safety or in the context of safety, the solution there is inevitably shifting to safety technology. Now we're saying that oh my goodness, we're going to be digitized and we're going to use technology, but we can do a way of doing manual things. Yes, we can do a way of doing manual things, but for how long? And if you remember some of the, some of the brands probably, I'm not going to say or name specific brands, but those brands that have not evolved with the, with the changes of the times, they they became obsolete, basically. They're no longer the leader in the industry. So if we want our company to remain a leader in our industry, the way forward is to continuously innovate and evolve ourselves. And we know that, especially in the global companies, that's the way we do things. That's part of our lives in the company. We always need to evolve. There's always new things. And we need to be on top of it or more advanced so that we are the business leaders or the leaders in our industry. So when we say safety technology or safety tech, some of you might have encountered this already or some of you might be new to this and you're not yet familiar with a safety technology or safety tech. So it covers all the new technologies now being applied to workplace safety. So as we say, it's already here now, but it's not going to be limited there as the technology advances and the knowledge of human beings and experts ad advances, safety technology will continue to evolve. Now, the challenge is how do we evolve with technology? For example, in mobile, uh, our mobile apps, wearables, for example, wearables that are our digital um, detectors, automatic detectors, rather than analog detectors. We used to have an analog work environment detector or personal detector from my previous company. So why not change it into a digital or real-time work environment measurement or a personal detector for toxic gases? So that's an example of wearables. Machine sensors, of course, we're familiar with machine safety, but instead of just mechanical way of protecting the workers, we use technology, we use machine sensors. The next one would be the cloud-based uh, software, which is now the, the demand in the change in safety management system. Predictive analytics. So predictive analytics is very interesting because it's part of the safety management software. It's, it's, it uses data, data analytics, and statistics, so math and science, in order for us to be able to simulate or forecast or do mathematical modeling so that we can predict at least somehow what could happen. So at least that's more of a proactive risk management, not just wait for things to happen and we just keep on guessing that, and we hope that the incident is not going to happen. With predictive analytics, we can simulate or extract a mathematical model. 3D printing, of course, robotics, real-time employee monitoring and tracking. 
it's not that we are stalking our employees, but we we are able to track our employees so that whatever happens and in case of emergencies, we know where to find them. So why am I saying this? Because from my previous company, we already have employee monitoring and tracking. And yes, it might be, it might uh, give some stigma or might have some stigma of thinking that, well, the company or the safety department is stalking me. We explain to them that we are not stalking you. The purpose of that is in a worst case scenario that in case of incidents or if you need to be extracted or removed or evacuated from where you are, we would know where to find you and how to find the right resources or support for you. Right, so that's real-time employee monitoring and tracking. PPE tracking with embedded uh, sensors. So PPE tracking is not just only the management of the PPE that we're going to monitor, but the condition of the PPE or what happens to the wearer of the PPE. So we are industrial 4.0, the interaction between the technology and the human workforce. But in industry 5.0, we make sure that there is ownership for the human workforce when it comes to the, for the data. And that's very important when it comes to ethics. Now, for example, here you will see on the slide, SaaS or SaaS, so software as a service versus or against legacy system, the traditional way of doing things. It might have become a comfort zone for us, the traditional or conventional way of doing things. But for how long are we going to, or will we be able to sustain our business by doing the traditional or, or conventional way of doing things? So when the competition now becomes greater and therefore the competition requires digital transformation. So how do we maintain or ensure that our business remains relevant. So here we're, we're going to give you a high level, high level information when it comes to digital transformation and how, and how do we contextualize it in safety. So we have learned what safety technology and what comprises safety technology, everything that we use as device or uh, equipment, or software, those are considered safety technology. So it's not only the physical device that we can, the, we can feel or see, but even uh, software and apps are considered already safety technology. Now, when it comes to digital transformation, we have heard this several times already. We safety professionals may not be well-versed when it comes to digital transformation, because it's not our core strength or function. It's basically in the field of IT, of course, of our software engineers. So that's why we have our lead software engineer here with us. If you have any IT related questions, he would be very happy to help you with that. But now that we are now in a digital age, it is inevitable that it overlaps with safety. And therefore, safety professionals should know a little bit, of course, not a level of expert, but a little bit about information technology or digital transform transformation and how it can be used for the advancement of our safety management in the company. So there are two things when it comes to digital transformation. So I'm just looking on my clock. So first is digitization. There are used interchangeably, probably you have heard them used interchangeably, digitization and digitalization, but they have nuances. Digitization is more on transforming information from our physical format, meaning to say our printed copies, our card copies, or all our paperwork into a digital format, electronic copies or electronic versions. Now, emails, PDF format, now you see here on the webinar, those are considered digital version rather than a physical format. So that is digitization. So digitize refers to the act, the action of transforming anything non-digital into a, into a digital 
uh, representation that our computer systems may utilize to automate operations or workflows. So for example, our hazards report or our incident reports from its paper report, our safety officer will encode them into a computer. So that is a process of digitization. We transform the physical data into electronic data. Right. Digitalization is the use or the utilization of a technology already to enhance or improve business processes okay, or enhance corporate processes. So it's not just limited to IT or it's not just limited to HR or enterprise resource planning, for example, logistics, supply chains. It is also useful for safety. So highly useful for safety management. So the purpose of digitalization is to describe the process of enabling, improving, and transform business operations or business processes. It means if we have a business process that is heavily manual, heavily physically manual activities, we use technology to transform it into a digital form to change it into digital or electronic form and at the same time to make the process easier and faster so that's digitalization it's more on process improvement so it's not just the practice of we do the tap timing we do the six sigma for example or productivity improvement we measure all the the time start and the time and we do the time and motion study for example so it's not just that physical measurement, but we transform the process into a faster way of doing things. So it's basically the future ways of working or the new ways of working. And that's where the disruption will come in because from the old ways of doing things, digitalization is the new way of working. So it's a radical change. That's why it's called transformation. So transforming business operations through the use of digitized data and technologies, whether there are apps, there are wearables, there are devices, there are cloud-based softwares, using technologies in, in order to optimize the business processes make the organization, make the business more productive, more efficient, highly competitive leader in the industry. So in a nutshell, digitization relates to information, the transformation of information, whereas digitalization refers to the transformation of processes. So if we want to move towards the journey of digital transformation, these two will have to happen transforming things, transforming data into digital, uh, digitized form and transforming our processes, our manual processes into a uh, digital form. So we did digit, uh, digitalization and digitization. Those are the components of digital transformation. So data and use of technology. All right. So aside from safety technology, understanding the difference between digitization and digitalization, the other thing, you know, probably when it comes to ethics, this is where it sits, the organizational culture or the corporate culture. How mature, how mature is our company when it comes to change and innovation and transforming it? How mature is our company when it comes to safety? because that will be the determinant of how you are ready or how ready we are when it comes to transforming, innovating, reinventing, or evolving our company. So if all other processes in our company transform, let's say the HR has their own uh, HR uh, automated system, the, ER, the logistics supply chain have their ERP, why not safety? Why not safety when in fact we deal with human lives? And therefore, based on that basis alone, that since safety is 
dealing with human lives and pro protect lives and save lives, it's just logical to provide the best solution or the best tool for safety. So its safety is heavy in technical, so it's mostly a background of uh, engineering, but we're not saying that it is exclusive to engineering alone, but it's heavily technical in engineering. But at the same time, it has administrative function. Okay? So, so it has administrative responsibilities. So we have to be uh, strategic. So what is the level of your organizational culture now? Where are you at? Because that will determine the speed of your uh, transformation. And if we're not going to be able to evolve, so I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was just last week, actually, when we were in a FinTech festival or digit with uh, Digital Filipinas, sponsored by Digital Filipinas. And one of the speakers, uh, their plen plenary speaker speakers have shared that companies who will, who fail to transform digitally will eventually become obsolete. And we might not take it seriously for now because we might still able to sustain or keep our processes or businesses afloat. But that is not a proactive approach. And we know that, that we don't want to wait for things to happen to us. It's very important that we will be proactive when it comes to safety management. So what are the common concerns of safety when it comes to technology and digitization? Or what are the concerns of the business when it comes to safety, technology, and digitization? So there are two things basically that we have to deal with. The concerns of safety when it comes to using technology and digitization, but at the same time, the concerns of the business itself, corporately, when it comes to using safety technology and digitization. Again, if other business processes are using technology and digitization, why not safety when safety is a business strategy and we are protecting and saving lives. So that is something that we need to reflect on or I will let it sink in uh, with you. So the first thing is the perceived cost versus real value. So we have a perceived cost that technology is expensive and safety is not bringing in money to the company. It is a service department okay? or it is a support department. So it does not bring in the real uh, money uh, money inside the, the company. It's not the production, it's not the sales. So the perceived cost is all expense. It has no return on investment. But again, the argument there would be, uh, you compare it with a perceived cost that it is expensive versus what is the real value of safety? So there are two prongs actually, or it's a double-edged sword. We think that innovation and safety technology is expensive, and therefore, what do we communicate to our employees that we are not are that we are not willing to invest for their safety, that we are not willing to innovate safety in order to ensure their safety, in order to ensure their welfare and their their well being. So that's why I say it it is a double edged sword. So it's perceived cost, it is expensive. It is expensive because it is using engineering expertise. It is technology, it is innovation. So those are the reasons why it is expensive. But the perceived cost or a perception that it is expensive, but compare it to the real value of lives of our employees and the business value of safety to the company. And therefore, we will be able to realize that the perceived cost is actually minute or not comparative to the real value of the human lives, the lives of our employees, the life of our business, the life of our company. The other thing is, when we think of it as it is expensive, it is a safety technology, we cannot afford that. We are just a small and medium uh, company. Therefore, we will find, or if we're going to shift to a digital transformation, we will have difficulty doing that, or we'll just find someone who can offer it in uh, cheaper. So that's why there's a meme there. There's always someone who will say that they can do it cheaper. But again, 
will it be at the expense of safety? So a while ago, or during the introduction, Bianca showed you the safetycenterph.com, which is the all-in-one, our one-stop shop for all things safety equipment and personal protective equipment. And Bianca mentioned that in safetycenterph.com, we make sure the reputation or the integrity of the suppliers, the vendors, as well as the safety the safety equipment themselves. Why? Because it's safety. We are talking about lives. So that's how important safety is. That's how important integrity is when it comes to safety. So is it worth risking the life of our business, the life of our employees, just so we could say, or we could find a cheaper technology, but there is no such thing as cheap technology. So we just perceived it as expensive because we don't see the real value of that technology or that solution in our company. So this is an abstract or an excerpt actually from the HSE article, the core benefits that safety tech has for business. It is mandatory at a minimum, it is mandatory for the companies to have safety management system or have safety technology as a tool to help safety management. However, if we're not able to have that, so that there might be a huge impact to our safety management. Eventually, the safety technology is supposed to help us reduce more incidents, prevent incidents from happening, and therefore, have more monetary values or cost savings compared, compared to the situation if we don't have that. Okay. So that is one thing that uh, we would like to communicate because most often than not, we encounter safety officers that are very much willing to shift into digital transformation. However, they have difficulty in explaining to uh, their team or to their top management how do we uh, defend this? How do we defend safety? That safety is good for the business qualitatively, but also quantitatively. And there is a perception that if we're going to invest in this solution or technology, it is going to be an expense. There is no return on investment, but actually there is return on investment. And that's what we're going to uh, deal with. And we need to be able to communicate effectively as safety professionals. So we, we're not just good in saying that safety is all about lives, which is, of course, non-arguable. So we cannot debate that. But however, we need to understand the practical needs of the business. And that is to generate revenue and to keep the, keep the business growing. And safety cannot remain just an expense. Safety has to be a business strategy or operational strategy for the company. The other concern is when it comes to data, data security. So in terms of IT and data security, so I mentioned their IT because it might not, it might not just be the digital or the digitized uh, form of our information, but as well as Sorry, I think there's someone annotating in my presentation. All right, thank you. So IT, in terms of infrastructure as well, how do we ensure that our infrastructure, IT infrastructure is robust and secure? And when it comes to data security, how do we ensure that our data will not be breached? So for example, here in Rethink IT, considering that we have the expertise in safety and security, we need to ensure that all our clients are secured. In terms of security, we know that it is a zero trust policy. Unlike safety that we bank on trust, security does not bank on trust. So security relies on zero trust. And that's why it's very important to have digital risk protection or digital risk management. Now, how is it going to be a threat to the human workforce or is it going to be a threat to the human workforce? Will there be an uprising of machines? Okay, um, 
it would probably uh, improbable. It may not be impossible, but for now, probably it could be improbable. But again, that's why it's very important to have the ethics. Will there be disappearance of jobs? Will safety officers be um, removed or be replaced by machines or equipment or softwares? Will there be reduction of tasks? Will it be an avenue to isolate oneself from human interaction or human relationship? Or we will be fully reliant on technology that we will no longer use our human faculties or human abilities in critical thinking, decision-making, and ethics. So that is a no. So definitely the technology is not going to be a threat to the workforce. In fact, it's supposed to be, or it is an enhancement improvement in the productivity or the way of life or way of doing things for our physical or human workforce. The next one is the fear of change. So who wants change? Everybody wants change because everybody wants improvement, but no one wants to change first. And that's an issue. But for safety, it's not supposed to be an issue. So we know that there is no improvement without change and change should start with us. And therefore, the disruptor for the status quo or inefficiencies and agents of change and continuous improvement in safety boils down with us safety professionals. So safety workforce for uh, workforce with technology and digitization. How do we interact technology and how do we inter integrate workforce with technology and digitization? So the value of the human workforce, technology is good in doing, it will make our task or our processes highly efficient, but it is not good in being, it does not have a soul, it does not have the heart. So it is still the human workforce, it is still the human beings, the employees who will provide the soul or the heart of the company. It is not the technology or the software that we use. Human workforce is the conscience of technology or the ethics of technology. So how good or how bad that technology is will depend on the ethics of the human designers behind it. So that's why it's very important to have the ethics behind the technology. And that's where safety sits in because safety is, ba is banking on ethics. Human workforce is the end user of technology and therefore human workforce will not be obsolete, will not be removed because in the first place, we are using technology or we're having technology because of them for them to or to help them become more efficient technology cannot function without the human workforce designers of technology are all human workforce technology is just a tool for the human workforce and the safety culture of the company is defined by human workforce so basically technology is not a threat to our human workforce so i would like to share this short video with you when it comes to ethics behind the technology or the value of ethics with technology. Once upon a time, business as usual was often good enough. No more. Where we are going, good enough is dead. In a world where everything is connected, where everything is equally excellent, where performance is reaching perfection, there's only one space left to innovate in. You. Right now, you are a central point in the raging tornado of change fueled by digitization, mobilization, augmentation, disintermediation, automation. Well, the list goes on. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Think about self-driving cars or computers that can learn and think. The way we work will never be the same. The skills we need will be dramatically different. Winning or losing are now happening faster than ever before. So what's your response? How will you discover new opportunities in one of the most transformational times in human history? Are you driving change? or are you being driven by it? Disruption has become the new normal. With change, it's always gradually, then suddenly, well, things really have stopped happening gradually. 
This change is exponential. Everything that used to be dumb and disconnected is now wired and intelligent. Cars, cities, ports, farms, even our bodies will be wired with sensors and will talk to each other. These game changers are also combinatorial. They amplify each other, creating a perfect storm of change. Quantum computing fuels big data. The Internet of Things fuels artificial intelligence and deep learning, which fuels robotics. However, anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. Human-only traits such as creativity, imagination, intuition, emotion and ethics will be even more important in the future because machines are very good at simulating but not at being. Yes, robots and software will do some of our work, but this will allow us to focus on things that cannot be automated. To imagine change squared, you've got to start engaging more with what might be, not just with what is. Immerse yourself in the immediate future, five to seven years out from today. We need to go beyond technology and data to reach human insights and wisdom. Technology represents the how of change, but humans represent the why. The future is about holistic business model. The opportunity is to be liquid, to learn just in time, not just in case, not single improvements, but complete transformations, not individual systems, but new ecosystems. Humanity is where true and lasting value is created. We will engage, relate and buy things because of the experiences they provide, because of their transformative power. The future doesn't just happen, the future gets happened. The new way to work is to embrace technology, but not to become it. The future is in technology, yet the bigger future lies in transcending it. Let's live and lead from here. All right. So now that we know the value of human workforce in digitization or in, and technology, so what are the disruptive potential in advancing our safety and business using technology? First is it will provide us operational efficiency and excellence. So we know that the, the trend now of the industry is moving towards operational excellence. We're no longer satisfied with average or just merely compliance. We want to excel. We want to achieve excellence. So that's the drive now of companies. With technology, especially with a safety technology, you will be able to achieve safety excellence. So it exceeds regulatory compliance because we know what are the minimum requirements for us to achieve regulatory compliance. But if we use technology, it's, it's beyond compliance already. It's being proactive. It's easier, faster way to collect things. Again, as I have mentioned before, those hazards or incident risk or data overall can be used to extract or develop a mathematical model that will help us do predictive analysis, just like what you see here on the slide. So it's a simulation of what could happen. That's part of risk management. So therefore, a risk management will not just be a semi-qualitative approach where we identify in the risk matrix what's the level of hazard or what's the level of risk rather, but we can even simulate if there is an incident up to what location will it reach. Of course, higher productivity of safety workforce, and we would be able to use our safety workforce on high value decisions and actions, strategic actions that are beneficial to the business. It will reduce or eliminate our administrative waste and it is continuous improvement driven. The next one is we show the money. We show the money to our top management. We show the money to the business. We show the money to our team and our company. And that's the value of safety to the business and the value of safety technology to the business. So we account for the cost savings, potential cost savings or actual cost savings and the cost avoidance if we're going to invest on a safety technology. So that's how we do cost benefit analysis. So rather with the perception or the perceived cost that it is expensive, we show 
the potential cost savings. This is the investment that is, this is just the investment compared to the potential quantitative monetary benefits, not to mention the qualitative or intangible benefits of the safety technology to the business. So it's very important for our safety professionals, not just only present the qualitative or the ethical moral basis or argument or defense or justification for do doing safety. We also need to ensure that we communicate properly to our business decision makers, the quantitative value or the, the benefits of safety and safety technology to our business. It provides competitive advantage. Why we remain relevant? We evolved as the global market grows and therefore we will continue to remain competitive or globally competitive. And of course, leadership excellence. So there is a buzz now when it comes to ESG, if you're familiar with that, environmental, social governance, it's very common, especially for the global companies. However, if we invest in safety technology, which is, I would assume that we have seen the ILO poster during the peak of pandemic, where ILO actually communicated or encouraged to invest in resilient OSH management system. So using the safety technology is not just for ensuring safety, not just making safety management efficient and effective, but it is ensuring that our safety management system is highly resilient. So ESGR stands for Environmental, Social, Governance, and Resilience. We are familiar with environmental. So all our environmental factors ensuring that we limit or we minimize our carbon footprint, or we are environmentally sustainable and responsible company. We are social res responsible company protecting the welfare of our employees and our communities. We have good governance. We ensure that we have ethical ways of doing things. We are honest. That's why we have core values because that's the standard of ethics for the company. And of course, resilience. So if we have the sa safety technology, you can access it, access it anytime, anywhere, and you would be able to manage safety wherever you will be. So that's the accessibility, the flexibility and resilience that safety te technology provides to us. And it's it actually reduces risks as well for our human workforce. And of course, the future of workplace safety is already here. Well, that it might be a misnomer because the future was supposed to be still coming. It's not yet here, but actually it's already here. The future is already now. So we are already in digitization. And the better data that we have, the good data that we're able to collate and analyze, the better decisions we're able to make in safety, the more effective we will be in doing our safety management. And based on survey from the EHS uh, Today article that you see there on the slide, the most or the must have safety technology for companies is the safety management system software, safety management system. So that's the must have safety technology for all companies. So in conclusion, so technology and digitization are inevitable. So it's not basically optional, it does not depend on our opinion, it's already here. And safety professionals should lead our champion that safety innovation in the company. So who else are we going to depend on when we want to transform the way we do things in safety in our company? So it, the, the management team, the leadership or the business depends on us. But the question is, how are we going to provide the right information for our employees to shift into digital transformation? Because we know that change is maybe frightening or uncomfortable. And that's why we have this webinar for us to know how to properly communicate it to not only our business decision makers, but also our employees on how to shift, not maybe immediately, but gradually into safety technology. Safety technology is not a threat. It is tool to reinforce the strength of our safety or human workforce. It is a complement and the higher the technology or the more advanced the technology, the more would be 
there, the more need there would be for our human workforce. Why? Because the ethics, the morals, the creativity will remain to be the strength and traits of the human being. Technology and digitization are beneficial to safety and business. And we have seen those data. There's a lot of research has already about that. So it's objective research that we can find. And the future of safety management is de technology and digitization. And therefore, with that, we encourage you, I encourage you to rethink your safety with technology's disruptive potential. Thank you very much. That ends my presentation. Alex, Bianca, back to you. We have Q&A. Thank you very much, Miss Joanne, or Engineer Joanne S. Jornella, for that very informative and uh, very direct um, lecture about how adv the advancements of technology for better OSH management still needs the guidance and um, needs to be side by side with uh, the human workforce. And now at this um, juncture, we see here questions um in our chat so we move on to the q a so if you have any questions anything under the sun i guess or hopefully anything under um uh safety or technology we have of course daryl bernardo mr daryl bernardo our it expert who is also um part of the rethink it team she he can um answer your questions uh regarding that and of course our keynote speaker um our keynote speaker, Engineer John S. Janela, for anything about safety. So let's um, cap it off. I hope everybody's not too um, overwhelmed. Um, you can uh, straighten up your chair or roll your shoulders. Medyo relax muna tayo ng ante. So uh, first off, we have here from uh, Mr. Paolo. I think this is for uh, Engineer John. So Engineer John, uh, he would like to learn more about the ISO 4503-2021, Occupational Health and Safety Management, Psychological Health and Safety at Work. So how can we adopt this guideline for managing psychosocial risks here in the Philippines? Ms. Joanne? The question is, how can we adapt ISO 45001 for the psychosocial uh, risk? Is that... Is that Ed? Uh, Alex, am I right? Yes. Yes. How can we adopt this guidelines for managing psychosocial risks in the Philippines? Ah, okay. So I think we're quite familiar with the with our mental health law, which is actually new for the Philippines, unlike other um, countries or nations that they have more mature um, mental health or psychosocial um, support, actually. But the way to deal with that is basically not just look into the compliance factor, but really d deep dive into the, the humanity or the needs of the human being. Because if we say that we're just going to base it to the ISO 45001, those are the list of standards that we need to make sure that we have in the company for the sake of we have our management system. But the thing is, is it a practical, practicable is that the only practicable solution for our employees? The way we deal with those psychosocial risks or needs of our employees is to really understand what are the psychological and the social needs of our employees. So when it comes to technology, again, so I will redirect it because it might be correlated to the pivot away from the human relationship. So the, the technology might move us away from technology, right? We are more into mobile devices now. We are more on social media. So we'd rather talk to other to the other person in so, on social uh, media. So that's the of the safety technology. So this, the psychosocial needs of our employees will not be addressed ultimately by our, by our safety technology. It only improves the processes, but the human interaction is still needed. For example, if you are calling a hotline and you're used to dial dial zero dial one it is still easier to interact with a human being so the human touch will not be removed 
And therefore, with the technology, we have to be more mindful with the psychosocial needs of our employees. For example, with our virtual activities now, yes, we did, for example, in Rethink IT, we did our Christmas parties for the last two years because we were full-time uh, work from home for the two years of pandemic. And it's very important to remain collaborative, uh, even virtually, and to get in touch or touch base with each of our employees or in our team to make sure that the psychosocial needs or psychological needs of our employees will still be addressed. Someone to talk to, a human being that they will be able to uh, speak with. But of course, nothing beats a face-to-face -face interaction, a human touch. So that is something that, as I had mentioned a while ago, technology will improve the way we do things, but it can not have the soul of the human being. All right? Thank you. All right, thank you. John, I see some questions emerging. <laughs> emerging. Um, I see some questions um, arriving here in the chat. Allow me to just um, double check and read them to you. Um, I guess this is um, addressing both of you. So Sir Daryl and Engineer Joan, uh, you could um, say your piece or anything that's on your mind to address this question. Um, with the emerging new technologies, what are the advantages and disadvantages these technologies would have um, great impact in the management style for safety and the general workforce? So your thoughts? Sir Daryl and John. Is it me or is it John? You're echoing that. Yes. Any, anybody, both of you can answer. Anybody can answer. Okay. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the advantages of uh, having a technology nowadays uh, is that uh, everything is automated. So. Uh, we don't need to have uh, many uh, physical devices or peripherals just to record or something like that. Uh, nowadays, uh, everything is in uh, in the size of our palms, uh, like our like our mobile phones. Everything is digital. Everything is uh, on the web. Everything is everything. Every information we need is on cloud or in or in the internet. And uh, I think uh, uh, by, by the negative impact of it, uh, it yeah, we humans will, uh, will get pampered by this kind of technologies and, <laughs> and we'll get lazy. There's a, there, are, there are times uh, that we humans get lazy <laughs> because everything is uh, automated. Uh, the uh, machines and technologies uh, always suggest something for us. Just to ease our efforts and work. That's, That's yeah. Uh, if I may add to that, to what that has, has mentioned, that's true. So the disadvantage, the advantage there would be we will have faster way of doing things, more efficient, reduced possibility of human errors in our business processes. So highly efficient, highly effective way of doing things. But the disadvantage there is that will there be a reliance or dependencies on technologies to the point that we're not going to rely anymore to our human traits. We're not going to rely anymore on our ethics. We're not going to rely anymore on our faculties. So as I mentioned a while ago in one of the, of the slides, so there is a risk or a disadvantage that we're just going to discuss things uh, via technology. So there's no human interaction anymore, no human relationship uh, anymore, or we'll just let the software do the thinking for us. So that might be a disadvantage or that might be a risk that we are seeing in terms of the social collaboration platform. For example, our social life and not, is now just within the laptops or the computers or in the virtual world. So we need to have the genuine relationship with the human interaction because at the end of the day, the ethics or the effectiveness of the technology will still depend on the ethics of the human workforce operating that technology. Okay, So that's why the 
on the video, on the short video that we have seen, the higher or the more advanced the technology is, the more valuable human workforce will be. So the human workforce will not be obsolete or will not be redundant it's because we have a software now. So the software will become the safety officer. No, because the critical thinking analysis, the judgment call, the ethics will still depend on the human workforce. Yes, it will make the safety officers work more, produce more, more effective, more accurate, providing more strategic actions to the company, bringing real value to the business because we reduce the administrative tasks. But the conscience of that software will still depend on the human workforce, which is the safety officer. So I think we can, we can discuss further, but for the interest of time, at least that's basically the, the essence of that. So the, the human workforce will not be irrelevant it will become more relevant as we transform into digitization or we shift into digital transformation. All right. Thank you, Lex. Thank you, Dad. You're on mute. On mute. I apologize. I was too distracted by so many questions here in the chat. I'm so sorry. But um, the next question, Engineer John, um, I think this is directed to you. So uh, just recently, the Department of Energy awarded 40 wind power um, service contracts offshore. So what will be the approach of the government in terms of safety trainings, you know, since our OSH policy is not updated. So wind turbine and solar energy is not included in the safety guidelines. Your thoughts on that, um, Engineer John? Thank you very much Thank for that wonderful, wonderful question. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a chemical engineer and I'm a member of the Philippine Institute of Chemical Engineers Process Safety Management Committee. So I will relate it later on on the uh, DOE activities or policies as well, but just to provide context. Here in the Philippines, we do not have process safety management guidelines or standards. And therefore, um, it's part of our, well, it's part of our moral obligation, and I'm part of that. I'm owning up to that moral obligation as a chemical engineer, since process safety is within the core function and strength or expertise of chemical engineers. And that's why we in Philippine Institute of Chemical Engineers, we are spearheading actually the development of process safety management guidelines. And that process safety management guidelines, we are coordinating already, we're already in talks with the Bureau of Working Conditions, the Department of Labor and Employment, and of course the Occupational Safety and Health uh, Center. So why am I saying this? Because that's a gap. And we do not want to uh, water down the reality that there may be gaps when it comes to the safety management standards and policies in our country. But the question there is, if we are not part of the solution, then definitely we are part of the problem. So the way we solve that, if we are the have that expertise in that field of uh, engineering, for example, in terms of energy, and if we have the expertise of safety in that field, or uh, engineering field or any uh, field of expertise, we have to take it as part of our moral obligation to reach out to our regulators because in fairness to our regulators, they're doing the best that they can to cope up with everything now. So like I mentioned before, we were in a FinTech festival uh, last week. There were some regula regulators there as well as speakers and attendees. And it's a reality that we need to also adapt in terms of regulations and standards here in the Philippines. We have to keep up with the digital transformation globally. Does it make sense? So in terms of safety management standards, we also need to keep up because the digitalization or digitization technology is not going to wait for us, wait for us to have the standards first before that happens. And therefore, it's very important that as it happens, for example, in safety design, we have this in process safety, we design it or we call it safety by design or inherently safer, that right from the design, there are already standards or ethics or 
uh, policies or boundaries set forth right from designing any engineering project. So whether you are in the uh, energy sector, you are in the manufacturing sector, construction sector, so we cannot just uh, say that it's the fault of our regulators if we don't have a standard. In fact, we might be the solution that our regulators are looking for. Okay, we have the subject matter expertise for our IT, for example. We, are, we as IT professionals would be able to help our DICT be able to come up with a robust, comprehensive policies for technology here in the Philippines. It's not only to limit the innovation, but to provide us the ethical boundaries and the right approach on how to manage all this digitization. For example, just like, um, I think it's already out of the topic, but for example, for the, for the cryptocurrencies right now, so that's why it's been tech. How do we regulate them? It's not regulated at this point in time, but it's already there. Okay, so it's decentralization already of the finance uh, technology. So that's why um, it says there in one of our uh, videos earlier that it's not just going, it's not going to wait for us. Technology is not just going to uh, to happen. It's already here. It's already happening. It's not in the near future. It's already here. The future is already here. Not near. It's already here. So if we have gaps in regulations, it is our, I would say, ethical obligation or moral obligation if we have the expertise to reach out to our regulators to improve our standards or policies in the country. All right. Very well said, um, Engineer John Janela. So, um... I think this is a follow-up question. Your next question, Athena, from Mr. Julio Ventanilla, the one who, uh, the one who asked for um, something to do with emerging technologies. Um, Engineer John, does this mean that uh, once nag emerge na mga technologies natin, will this be reducing or streamlining the workforce, or uh, what will happen? Kuba robots will ano or <laughs> what? What's going to happen? Uh, yeah. So we've we've shown it in our uh, slides a while ago. What are the concerns when it comes to technology? Will there be a rise of the machines? <laughs> Will there be, um, yeah, the, we're going to be ruled by a robot, so to speak. So, well, definitely it's improbable. Okay. So again, that's why the ethics is very important. The human nature or the human traits are very important when developing technology or using uh, technology. So will it streamline the workforce? When we say streamline processes, that involves all the resources in the company. But that's why there is a question a while ago, will it reduce workforce? And will it remove the human workforce? But actually it's not. So based on the studies and based on the research, for example, even internationally, the way that safety technology or technology is going to help the company or the workforce is to make their activities or processes more efficient so that they would be able to focus on high value adding activities. So they will be able to attend to important decisions, important actions, strategic actions, rather than wasting their time in administrative tasks. So basically, it is a continuous improvement strategy. It is a reduction of waste. The purpose of the safety technology or technology, when we see it in our production, we're not just referring to safety technology or even the automation that we see in the companies. So it is producing faster, weaker, good quality product. And therefore, the productivity or the efficiency of the company is higher. So that's the purpose of it. And our human workforce will focus on real or reducing the waste, right? So that's the bottom line of using the technology. It is to reduce the waste. So we will have more time in addressing our psychosocial, the psychosocial needs of our uh, employees. We will have more time on ensuring that we will still use our human faculties, our critical analysis. We will still be human beings. We will still be able to have interaction and real and genuine relationships 
with human beings and not just off uh, offline or virtual, All right? So there might be a concern that oh, it's it's or and it, we think that it is an advantage because we don't want to deal with the complexities of of a human being. We know that human relationships are complex, so that's what makes us human. That that makes us different. That human complexity. And we need that complexity that that cannot be digitized, actually. Those human qualities that cannot be digitized. A conscience, soul, ethics, or else they're crazy. All right. Thank you, Alex. All right. Um, another question here. Um, we're really getting into sunod sunod na, no? Next, my next, my next, my next questions. But I think. Um, of course, our uh, two panelists uh, can handle it, so keep them coming. Um, from Mr. Awalu Dan Baba. So, in short form, what items are safety technology? So, I think this can um, be for Engineer John Estrinella as an OSH professional, and of course, uh, Mr. Daryl Bernardo as well as a technology expert. So, what are your thoughts and what are safety technologies? um these days uh i think i will answer it first uh we've shown the data we have shown the, the objective data when it comes to what safety technologies are needed by companies and the number one would be safety management system or safety management software okay so it's cloud-based software now that's the drive of the technology and the next one would be the wearables or ppe okay so at least those are the top top three. So safety management software, basically you have everything there when it comes to safety management. But of course, when it comes to inspection, for example, so you might be using a drone instead of the human workforce physically going into the hot zone and other countries are already doing that. So you're using technology to do inspection. So mobile devices to do the inspection, wearables as well as uh, machines or other devices. That would you like to add? To that? Uh, I think for me that uh, that you already summarized what what, what was the answer. <laughs> okay, so just to add, Sir Daryl, um, can we use VR, augmented reality, maganyan when it comes to safety management? That's is that part, part of the? Is it is it, is it, is it part, part of it? I mean, just on the top, the top of my head, just a question. Actually, for me, um, um, by by detailed uh, um, explanation, uh, I think uh, there are some uh, uh, kinds of technologies that we are having have now. Uh, for example, our uh, uh, sensors, uh, sensor devices that uh, mimics a uh, human sensor, because uh, we humans uh, first take or something. Um, we, uh, we humans always uh, detect something that will happen. Uh, so we, we use technology and apply it to, to those devices and then we can incorporate it on um, or to build uh, some a machine to help us. Uh, for example, the sa that safety uh, management system. Uh, we all, uh, we here in the Philippines, uh, where our country is uh, in a tropical, a tropical country, uh, there are always uh, typhoons. So, so we can incorporate um, satellite satellite images um, to predict uh, what, uh, what 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 weather will be. I think that that's it for me. Okay. <laughs> Lex, you are on mute. Hello, Alex. You are on mute, Lex. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you.
There, can you hear me now? No. Is yes. it okay? Can you hear me now? Good. Yeah. All right, I apologize. So um, thank you for letting me know that I'm on mute. Uh, there are so many questions, but this one, this is the last question addressed to um, technology not directly. Um, I think this one will be uh, a good question. We apologize for some that have, you know, their questions, but we'll try our best to chat with you later on and the next hour of the, sh uh, of the show, of the webinar event. We'll try to chat with you and then they'll try to answer. But I think this one is a good uh, question to end off our portion. Uh, so, Sir Daryl, um, what kind of technology ba or processes at this time? Um, which is available now, or I guess you can suggest, no, uh, that can help shift the focus na to data security and company safety altogether na. Pagdating Pagdating sa business, business, including their employees. Could you please repeat the question? Can, <laughs> can you please uh, elaborate um, more? Um, I think uh, what she's trying to say here is uh, what kind of technology or processes uh, based on you know your expertise na masasabi mo, Including business and employees now. I think nowadays, um, do you guys hear me? Does anyone? Yes, that we can hear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, uh, we all uh, all applications or more applications use uh, KYC, uh, know your customer, uh, where applications uh, need to access through biometrics, uh, camera sensors, etc., etc. Et without us need to authenticate by a password, which is a high uh, vulner vulnerability through hackers. Uh, we use our face, uh, our face, our, our fingerprints to, to access uh, applications, um, giving you trust and need to use that app. And it, uh, it will reduce uh, data breach, increase the reliability, reliability of end user, or organization and company. Uh, I think uh, the priority of this uh, technology is to, to build trust from uh, from us humans to digitize. I think that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your answer, uh, Mr. Daryl Bernardo. So that's it for our Q&A portion. And um, again, I hope everybody's not too overwhelmed, not too... Um, um, rattled with all the information, data, and whatnot. And for the case of that, um, allow me to just um, share with you yung ating raffle, by the way, to announce to everyone. Our raffle is still ongoing. Our um, golden question is posted. Um, you can check out your house rules and also the mechanics magkasama yan. So just log on to your www.safetyhow.com accounts. And then you can check your profile messages so you can learn more and join. And later on, um, we will be announcing the winners. Dun sa ating raffle and also um, the golden question. And we're going to announce also the early bird. So, uh, kung sino yung una nating um, arrival or attendee na nag-arrive na uh, with our Zoom, that is our early bird winner. So, in this juncture of the event um we will allow everyone to just sit back and relax as we turn over to the floor one of our rethink it team members see miss che miss che are you there so while miss che is preparing she will be showing everybody a live walkthrough and just a very brief and concise demo of how Rethink EHS as a safety management software is um, good for your occupational safety and health uh, management for your business and organization. So, Ms. Che, please do enlighten us with this product that we have here. Hi, thank you, Alex. Can everyone hear me well? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Chet. Yes, thank you. So I'll be uh, giving a short walkthrough or overview of Rethink EHS. So again, this is a web-based 
safety management system that is proudly made by Rethink IT. So I will now log in as the administrator. Now Rethink EHS, our basic package has seven modules, namely incident manager, risk manager, observation manager, compliance manager, meetings manager, business manager, and content manager. So as an administrator, I have the access to the setup. So for the setup, this is where you configure the units and department existing in your organization. You can also create hotspot map. So for this one, you can upload the layout of your facilities offices or branches. For user preferences, so the system is very user friendly, wherein everything is uh, drop down selection. You can use your own terminologies. Next for employee records. So this is where you enroll the possible system users. So the employee records is in accordance with um, Data Privacy Act of 2012. All information are treated with confidentiality. So you can see employee details, the address, their designation, trainings attended, trainings required, including the medical profile. And if employees are involved in incidents, so you can have the record of incident logs so that you can assess if, it, if they have a problem on skills or behavior. Next is for the system users. So the system has different roles you can assign to the system users. So the system roles will limit their access to what modules and what transactions they can do with the system. So as an administrator, I have the access to all the seven modules and the setup. Now for the safety officer, he has the, ac the access to all modules except for the setup. Then for the role of the investigator, so this is the person who conducts accident investigation to get the root cause. So once you are able to get the root cause, the role now is the action officer who will give the control or the corrective actions. Next role is for the notifier. So if you are logged in as a notifier, this will be the screen you will see. You do not have access to any of the modules, but only for the notice of incident form. So this is an example of the form. The available fields are still customizable. The nature of incident is categorized into safety, environment, health, and security. Then the activity at that time is mandatory field. Now you can put the brief description of what happened on the incident. This is a free typing box so that you can edit as you go along with your uh, accident investigation. So you can record if there are injured person, who are the involved person, what is the immediate action, and you can attach pictures, multiple pictures, and then submit. So that is for the notifier. Now we have an audit trail wherein all the transactions or executions being done in the system is recorded and timestamped. Then next for the alert, so the system has a built-in escalation wherein you can set the number of days before the due date of the task assigned. You can also input who will be the recipients of those notifications. So the notifications can be received through system notification. It means if you are logged in, you can see it on the bell button here, all the notifications, or you can also receive 
notifications from your corporate or uh, corporate email addresses, which a link will be sent to you. Then you have to click that link so that you have to log in with the with Think EHS. Then you also have notifications for permits. So you can assign number of days before it will expire. The system will remind you. So this is a good feature where you will be able to avoid penalties when you overlook um, expiration dates. Now the system also have the dashboard. So everything that you do in the transaction can be translated into graphical qualitative presentations. So this is just an example. You can have your risk matrix. So this is a five by five, wherein once you mouse over, it can give you a definition of what is catastrophic. So there is a tool tip for this system. You can also measure the safety milestone. It can be in terms of man hours and man days. Now for the hotspot map, again, if you have the layout, you can plot your facilities. So with the click of the mouse, you can zoom in. You will know that in that particular area, there are four incidents, one hazard, non-conformance, and with just a click of the mouse, you're able to get the details of what are those four incidents. So going back to the dashboard, we also have, a, you can also have a bar graph for the monthly incident that has, that has been recorded and closed risk or hazard that has been identified and controlled, and for the non-conformance, so what have been identified and corrected. For the incident severity class rating, we have a tooltip here. So you can use your own uh, definition of what is class one to five. So you can describe the impact to people in terms of slight injury to fatality, the impact to your process, is there a disruption on your operation? The impact on the property, are there loss of assets? The impact to environment, so if there are pollution, as well as the impact to the reputation, so if the incident has caused, has caused public awareness. The next Incident by category, so again, the nature of incident can be categorized if it involves environment, health, safety, security, and others. Now, let me discuss to you how each module works. So the incident manager, this is uh, where you report uh, the incident. So this is just an example of the form that has to be filled up by the notifier. So again, the nature of incident, you just, you can choose from the selection radio buttons if it's safety, environment, health, and security. Then once you send your notification, it will go to the records. Then all the notifications should be assigned by the safety officer to the accident investigator. So you will know the responsible person. So let me show you a filled up form. So these are the form, the, this is the form that has been filled up. So in terms of incident outcome, you can have a registry of injury. So the form in the injured person is in accordance with the report that you need to submit with the Department of Labor. So you can uh, label the parts injured, the details of the outcome, if you need treatment, first aid, medical treatment, restricted work, uh, lost time or fatality. So the, uh, the report from Department of Labor is uh, downloadable into an editable Word file. So whatever you inputted on the system can be generated in an editable version of a Word before you can 
uh, decide to submit it to the Department of Labor. So going back, you also have uh, illness registry, property damages, and environmental impact. For the analysis method, in, uh, you can use your own root cause analysis technique. The most common is fishbone and YY analysis. So again, the incident based severity is class one to five. Then you can attach supporting documents. And then for the conclusion, uh, you can summarize uh, all the information you have gathered for the accident investigation. Now for the corrective actions, uh, this is where you can do the hierarchy of control, which is starts from elimination. If it's not applicable, just click not applicable. Then next is substitution. After that is uh, engineering control. So sample of engineering control is if you wish to install barricades. Now the system also have recommendations on what is the technical specification of a compliant barricades. The next control is administrative. So for administrative, you can do audit in, and inspection if you have your checklist. You can also conduct training. So say, for example, you wish to conduct safety awareness training. Again, the system gives you the course outline so that the training managers can look for the safety training organization that can provide that specific course. Then you can uh, send invitations to the different uh, employees that has to attend that training. After the administrative, the last resort is um, PPE. So if you want to provide PPE, say for example, hard hat, again, the system from head to foot has recommendations on what is the technical specification of a compliant hard hat so that the purchasing can canvas on the suppliers. So these are the controls by hierarchy. So with that, you have to assign the responsible person, the due date and the estimated cost of that control. So that is for the incident manager. Um, the beauty of the, this module is you can also monitor the recurring incident. So if there are incident that is repetitive in terms of similar location, similar nature and similar root cause, so the system will help you identify if it is a recurring incident. Now I'll proceed with risk manager. So this is where you can input your, uh, if you have a database of your hazard list per process, per location, you can incorporate it in the system. Now the results of non-compliance or non-conformances in the audit and inspection are also treated as hazard as well as all the root causes are also treated as hazard, wherein you can process, process it in the risk manager. So for the risk manager, you have to, to assess. So there's a process of risk assessment. So this is the form that you have to fill up. You can attach picture, the risk rating, the analysis method, you can attach supporting documents, and what are the controls for that existing hazard. So once you are able to implement a control for the hazard, you can measure its effectiveness. So if the score is high before it was implemented, you then you implement that hazard, that control, you're able to achieve the risk reduction. So that is for risk manager. Next is the compliance manager. So you can do your own audit and inspection if you have the checklist. So you can automate it. So an example of this is um, here you will know what are the compliance result, result list if you pass or failed in that particular audit or inspection. Compliance frequency, when will be the next audit so you know the schedule and the due date. 
So let me just show you an example of, of the checklist. So if you have a da daily employee COVID-19 checklist, so these are the questions per line item, answerable by yes or no. So if a line item is non-compliant, you can attach the existing condition and the ideal condition. So that is for clients manager. Next is business manager. So this is where you can register the permits, licenses, safety data sheets, DPI. So the system can remind you when will be the next renewal after the before it expires. We also have again employee records. Then you also have a record of third party profile. So these are your suppliers, con contractors, data registry, the training, the requirements for their accreditations. Then last is energy consumption. So you can monitor the usage per location. So you can view the history. So some of the examples of energy name are fuel, solar, water, wind, and anything that you wish to monitor by location. The next module is uh, observation manager. So in this module, you can report unsafe act like not wearing hard hat and unsafe condition like wet floor. So an example of this is the, this form. So you can attach picture and the corrective action for that unsafe act and unsafe condition. Then next is the meetings manager. So this is where you can put your activities in a calendar. So in the record, say for example, you have a monthly business review. So you can send invitations. You can use this to do your minutes of the meeting. You can attach supporting documents and you can also assign actions relative to the meeting. Then last module is the content manager. So this is the electronic library of Rating EHS wherein you can upload and download uh, documents, laws and regulations, policies, forms, and checklists. So these are the seven modules of um, Rating EHS. Uh, what I will show you now is another feature of Rating EHS, which is the EHS Pulse. Uh, uh, please give me a few moments to share to you the mobile app or my mo through my mobile phone. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen already? Uh, not yet, Miss Che. Hold on. All right. Yeah, can you see my screen? Hello. Yes, Chair, we can see your mobile. See you, Ms. Chair. Yes. Okay, so um, EHS Pulse, again, is a mobile app. It's an instant safety messenger. So if you are familiar with 
uh, Viber, Instagram. So it works similarly as EHS Pulse. So I will just log in to EHS Pulse. So again, EHS Pulse is a uh, part of rating EHS. So since I'm already logged in with EHS Pulse, what appears is my chat list. So these are the, the names of those people that I can chat with. So I can also start a new chat and then look for the names of the person that I want to send a message. So this app, you can create a notification so unsafe act and unsafe condition so say for example I, I would like to report something so i can add photos using my the the camera or i can look for a picture in my gallery you can attach multiple pictures then title Say, for example, it's an expired car registration. So what happened? So say, for example, the admin is the admin overlook the expiry date. So there's already the date and the time. So where did it happen? The office. So with the use of EHS Pulse, I can share this report to the group. And then I can also send that notification. So in the notification page, so these are all the notifications I have. Another example is an octopus wiring in conference room. So what happened, date, time, where did it happen, and who created that report. Now this uh, EHS pulse is connected to rating EHS. Uh, I will show it later. Then next tab is uh, you have your own profile. Wherein you can edit your nickname. So that's it. So um, EHS Pulse is very easy to use. So let me just shift again to rating EHS to show you where does the notifications done in EHS Pulse once you click the submit. Uh, will go. Hello, so hello, can you hear me? So again, um, I'm logged in in uh, rating EHS. So the notifications that came from EHS Pulse will go through the incident manager module. So in the record, there's a tab here, Pulse notification. So these are all the notifications coming from the EHS Pulse. So I can use the rating EHS to process it. So say, for example, the octopus wiring, I just have to click create notification. And then the selections here are now activated. And then I just have to label if it's a uh, Incident, identify if it's an incident or a hazard. So if I label it as an incident, 
uh, will need to process this notification using the incident manager. But if I if this notice of incident is a hazard, then I will have to process it in the risk manager module. So that's it. That's that is the integration of Retic EHS and the EHS Pulse. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Ms. Che, for that walkthrough and brief live demo for our Rethink EHS or safety management software. If you do have questions, feel free to ask. You may email us at rethinkehs uh, at rethinkit.net, or you can chat us uh, here at our Zoom chat or connect with us on our social media pages, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, so you can direct your questions to us. All right, everything's good. So with that, allow me to remind all of you again, your Safety Owl accounts is active now, so you can collaborate with your online safety community here and abroad. Anytime, anywhere, your internet connection, kung sino yung man sa inyo may gusto mag uh, post ng articles, bulletins, infographics to help your fellow safety and health professionals, you can do so with the Safety Owl community. With that, you can always question, uh, you can always address your questions, rethinkehs at rethinkit.net or inquiry at safetyowl.com and you can address your questions to me, Bianca, Engineer Joan, Ms. Cher, of course, or Daryl once again. And you can follow us on our social media page. Oh, social media, social media uh, accounts as well. Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter is Rethink Safety, and our YouTube channel is Rethink IT. So again, <laughs> malaming, malaming, malaming salamat po sa pag-attend ng aming webinar. We have made it very special for all of you to show you our appreciation, and I hope to see you again next year. Malaming, malaming salamat po. Goodbye and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Congratulations, everyone.